I want to preach to you now, preach to you if I can, on, on a subject called Storm Chaser, the name of my book. The byline for the book says this, whatever storm you are facing, the power of God is there for you in the storm, and that power can change your world. You always find God in the center of every storm. You want to find Him? You'll find Him in the storm. There's probably 30 other words in the Bible that mean storm. Let me give you some to give you an idea of what I'm saying here. Uh, the word tribulation. The word trial. The word test. The word problems. Adversity. Suffering temptation, hardships, afflictions, ordeal, distress, hard times, fiery trial. All these things can be defined as a storm. And I'm going to use that in a sense as I talk about this subject. I'm reading for the third time Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. It's one of the best I've ever read. And here's what he says about life. Listen to this. He said, life is a series of problems. Now, I defined a storm by the word problem. So, can I change it and say it this way? Life is a series of storms. Either you're in one now, you're just coming out of one, or you're getting ready to go into another one. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? Okay, he said, the reason for this is that God is more interested in your character than your comfort. That's profound. More interested in your character than your comfort. We can be reasonably happy here on earth, but that's not the goal of life. The goal is to grow in character, to be like Jesus. He said, I used to think that life was hills and valleys. You go through a dark time, then you go to the mountaintop, back and forth. I don't believe that anymore. Rather, I believe that it's kind of like two rails on a railroad track. And at all times, you have something good and something bad going on in your lives. No matter how good things are in your life, there's always something bad that needs to be worked on. And no matter how bad things are in your life, there's always something good that you can thank God for. Wow, isn't that profound? I want to talk to you about the subject of faith. I've preached on faith all of my life. I come from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've heard thousands of messages on faith over the years. I want to suggest to you that there are three musts to the subject of faith. Three things you must do to walk in faith. Number one, you must confess with your mouth what God says in His Word. The Bible says, for with the mouth man confesses unto righteousness. We must confess our faith with our mouth. Secondly, the Bible says, if you have faith, you must Act on your faith. You must work it out. James says, don't tell me how much faith you got with your mouth. Go and do it, then I'll know that you got faith. The action pr uh, proves the fact that faith is in your heart. Now, the third must to faith, and this is an unusual idea, but I wrapped it around my book. The last thing that faith must do is faith must be tested. I don't think I've heard many sermons on that in my life. And I'm old enough now, I'm 72. I think I'm at a, at a point where I can talk about life. I've, I've lived quite a bit of it. Hope to live a whole lot more and I'm having fun. I'm gonna to go to James 1. My brethren count it all joy. I certainly don't, but James says do. When you fall into various trials, that's storms. Trials is another word for storms. Count it all joy when you fall into storms 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I like the word endurance there. The testing of your faith produces endurance. But let endurance have its perfect work that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, how many of us rejoice when we have trials or problems? Storms are a part of living, and not a lot of us rejoice. But James is giving us something here, and I'm going to show you this biblically, the power of this idea. Let's go now to Romans chapter 5. Here we are. And not only that, this is Paul now, this is not James. Not only that, but we also glory in storms. Whoa. We glory. The word glory there in, in Greek is a powerful word. It means to exult, to shout loudly. We shout loudly about storms. Knowing that storms produce there's that word perseverance. I'm going to put the word endurance in there again. Because storms produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. Now here's a singular message. Paul and James are saying the same thing. Folks, don't worry about your storms. Because when they come, that's where you find God. So get excited when it comes. Start shouting because you're going to watch the glory of God. God shows up in storms because our faith has got to be tested. Let me tell you what I found out this week. I was reading in my devotions in the book of Luke. And I came upon the scripture in Luke 4 where Jesus was tested. Where Jesus entered his first storm. You know what the Bible says? You ought to read it sometime really carefully. Then Jesus, hey, Jesus has just been baptized by John in the Jordan, and here's what happens. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Why? To face the storm. Are you there? This was God's pattern for His Son. All right, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Let's go to the desert and meet the devil head on. Jesus didn't run from it. Who led Him into the desert? The Holy Ghost. And He was tempted for 40 days. Now, I want to show two phrases to you that knocked the socks off of me this week. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, went to the wilderness, met the devil, overcame three primary temptations, and at the end of the temptation, you know what the Bible says? Then Jesus returned in the power. He went in filled, met the devil, overcame te temptation, and how does he come out? He's not only filled, he comes out with power. Where does the power come from? The power comes from the test. The power comes from in the trial, taking God's word and facing the devil with what God says in his word. Don't run from your test. Don't run from your storm. God is showing you some things. This morning early, when I was up, I was reading further on in, in Luke. You know what the Bible says? At the Last Supper, Jesus looks at Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you, not sheltered you from the devil, not let him take his crack at you. He said, but I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. You're going to get it, buddy, and it's coming tonight. The biggest storm of your life. But I prayed because you're going to make it. This is an entirely different way at looking at your life, saying, poor me. I got this to deal with, and I got that to deal with. 
I've had more storms in my life than I can tell you about. I'll tell you one thing. You find God in the storm. You know what Jesus said? These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have storms, tribulations. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. <laughs> There's the bottom line. Somebody say praise the Lord this morning. In the world you'll have storms, but praise God, I've overcome the storms. Let's go now to the next one in Matthew 7. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. This is a believer. And notice what happens. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. And they beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. Let's go to the next part of it. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Notice the same thing happened to both guys. The wise man and the foolish man both had what? They had rain descend, they had floods come, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell and great was its fall. You see, it's consistent in the word. Storms will come, tribulations will come, trials will come, but praise God, He has overcome the trial. One final verse here, and I want you to look at it carefully. We're going to go to Mark chapter 4. I'll read it to you. It's a part of the parable of the sower. Listen to what Jesus says here. These likewise, these people, where it falls on stony ground, are the ones when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but they have no root in themselves. And so they endure only for a time. Oh, and look at what happens. Afterward, when the storms come, when the tribulation or the persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. See, storms destroy a lot of people who once followed the Lord. I'll guarantee that there are people here who know others who've done this. I remember when my wife Jan was killed. I had three little children without a mother. I've been through storms. I'm not standing up here lecturing on something I don't know. My oldest daughter, Misty, who was 12, said, Daddy, why did it have to be my mommy? I really didn't know how to answer her. But I determined to find something in the Bible. And I went to the Word, and here's what I found. 1 Corinthians 10:13. No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to ever be tempted beyond what you are able to withstand, but will with the temptation also the, make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God has never let any of you go into something that you can't handle with His grace. No matter how bad it is, you'll make it with the grace of God. I want to finish my message now by telling you a story. This story comes right out of my book, Storm Chaser. It's chapter 6 in the book. I'm a member of the first graduating class of Oral Roberts University. I came down from Canada to go to ORU. I had no idea what God had for my life. When I got to campus, I met another young man named Larry Dalton, who was one of the most brilliant musicians I've ever known. And Larry and I decided to form a youth group to sing a little bit on weekends. On our own, we were not had no long-term plans. One of the members of the group had a father who pastored a Baptist church in Kansas City, Charismatic Baptist. 
they invited us to come up and sing. That weekend, 60 people came to Jesus. I was getting up on the Sunday morning to preach. The group had just finished singing. I was the preacher. I had my Bible. I stepped from the front row up to the platform as I was coming up the stairs. This loud, booming voice sounds from the back of the building. I have ordained you to go to the nations. There will come a time when you are homeless. Don't be afraid. I've called you to the nations as kings to conquer. Whoa! Our first concert. And I'm getting shot down with an arrow straight from heaven. Next day we went back, after we went back to ORU, we called a meeting with all the group, and I made an announcement. I said that word Sunday morning was from God. You know what I found out 25 years later? That word was spoken by one of the greatest prophets that America has seen. His name is Bob Jones. He later told me that God was going to give me a million dollar offering. And God gave me the million dollar offering. People say stuff like that, you better listen to them. I had no idea who he was. All I heard was the voice. So we made a plan. We itinerated all that summer in uh, 1969 we raised money for a trip to Africa our goal was Africa South Africa we raised $18,000 and uh, applied for our visas to South Africa the visas were turned down by the government for reasons we did not understand on December 15 I had decided that we would go north of South Africa into Rhodesia it is now Zimbabwe and we would prove our good intentions to the South African government and we'd get in and there, there would be no problems. All 16 of us flew, my wife Jan and I recently married, flew into Africa. I can't tell you the joy when that plane landed in Rhodesia. I was walking down the gangplank. I heard someone calling my name. Terry Law, Terry Law. I walked over to the immigration official and I said, yes, I'm Terry Law. He said, are these the people in your group? And he showed me a list. I said, yes, where did you get those names? He said, I am not here to explain myself. I'm here to give you an order. Our country does not want you. I'm asking you to get back on the plane and go wherever that plane goes, but we will not let you come here. I didn't believe them. But after 10 minutes of trying to argue, we got back on the plane. We ended up in a little country called Mozambique on the hip of Eastern Africa. Average temperature, 105 to 110. We had no money. We were put into a hotel or motel and just biding our time, hoping to stay because the inevitable was they would send us back home. We would be uh, refused immigration. Friends, when you have trouble like that, when that kind of storm hits you, let me tell you what we did. Someone had a book on fasting and prayer, so we all fasted and prayed. Someone else had a book on rebuking the devil, so we rebuked the devil like he'd never been rebuked. Somebody else had a book on praise and praise and worship, so we all praised God for victory. Someone else said we all need to repent, so everybody repented. We did communion every day. We made sure that we had nothing in our hearts against anybody else in the group. We all asked forgiveness for every sin we could think of. Three, three weeks later, the immigration official told me at the airport, we're sending you home tomorrow. We had been six months raising the money for the trip. The dream was there. I thought I heard God. 
when the man spoke from the back of the church. I did not believe that that plane would ever leave Africa, but it left the ground. And somewhere over mid-Atlantic, my bass singer, Bo, knelt beside me on the plane and said, Terry, I'll never trust God again as long as I live. He's pulled the rug out from under us. Our dream is gone. We ended back in New York City, the coldest winter in 99 years. All of our clothes were in Africa. They'd gone by ship. I remember Jan standing outside of the terminal in New York City in a short sleeve cotton dress, goose pimples on her arms, and just shaking. I turned around and I kicked a snowbank with my foot and I said, God, this isn't fair. We've done everything we know everything we know we had friends in philadelphia who put us up in a teen challenge center we were supposed to help counsel drug addicts we needed more counsel than the drug addicts on a saturday our first saturday there a man showed up in chapel nobody knew him his name pastor whittle from Minneapolis just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Didn't know why God had called him to Philadelphia, but he showed up in chapel on Saturday morning. Here's what he said. What do you do when you know God has called you, yet it appears as though he's taking that calling away? What do you do when you pray and there's only silence in return? Can I ask that to you directly? What do you do when you pray and there's only silence in return? How do we handle this silence of God? This is one of the great principles of life. Everybody was shocked. I looked at Jan. Jan was crying, my wife. I looked at Bo. Bo was sitting with his eyes rimmed with tears. I'd never seen Larry cry. He was crying. Then the man went on and he said this, even when God is completely silent, he is still there with you. And when it seems like he's broken all of his promises and revoked his calling, he will remain faithful to make that call a reality. But sometimes we've got to come to the end of our plans in order for God to accomplish his plan. When the man was done, I asked him to come to a side room. I told him what we'd just come through. He prayed for a moment, he looked up, pointed his finger at me, said, Terry Law, in seven days, you will be in Jan Smuts Airport, Johannesburg. <sighs> Absolutely impossible. We had no money, we couldn't get visas. This was the biggest trial or storm that I, up until that time that I had ever gone through. But you know, the next week on Wednesday, I got two phone calls. The first call was from the State Department saying South Africa has granted your visas, you're free to go. I said, fine, you got any extra tax money in Washington? You'd like to send some young people to Africa? He was not amused. The next call I got in the afternoon came from California. The pastor had gone to Swiss Air, told them our story, and Swiss Air gave us the tickets and returned to go 16 young people to go to Africa. We got off the plane seven days later. It was like I was in a fog. But this time we knew that God had sent us. We saw 10,000 decisions for Jesus that next year. Shook the entire country. And two months after this, I was praying in a church outside of Johannesburg the group was singing, and Jesus came in the room. 
And he said, I'm going to send you to closed nations. I'm going to send you to the hard places. If you'll trust me and be obedient, I will protect you. Those are my marching orders. That's why I was in Iraq two weeks ago. My friends, listen to me. If I had given up in the middle of that mess like I wanted to give up, threw up my hands and say, God, you don't know where I am and you don't care what I'm doing anymore, I would never be here today. I would never have seen hundreds of thousands of people around the world come to Jesus. God is silent. Why? You know why? Because he, if he's never silent, you never have to exercise faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why is he silent with you right now? Because he's got something coming that's bigger than anything else you could ever imagine. We are filled with the Spirit, like Jesus. We go into the wilderness, but when we come out of the wilderness, we come in the power of the Holy Spirit. Someone say amen this morning. God has to test your faith. That's the only way he does business. He's testing your faith. Are you going to get through? You will. If you'll trust him because he's there with you in the storm. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It's true, it's clear. But I know right now, listening to me, there are people in the middle of huge storms, trials and difficulties. They're facing your silence. And there are many wondering what in the world's going on. But Father, you've given a word to my heart to preach. And you have people now who are being helped and encouraged by what your word says. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I'm not asking this to embarrass anyone in this room, but if you're in the middle of a storm this morning, I'd like you to quietly raise your hand right where you are. Hold it up. I see hands all over the room. Could I ask you to do one more thing? Would you stand where you are, right where you are. Just stay where you are, but just stand to your feet for just a minute. We're praying to a God who hears, a God who is not silent. So join me in the prayer, please, everyone in the room. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the God of the storm. You are in the storm. You're there to help me. And Heavenly Father, I come to you now in the middle of my storm. You know that I hurt. You know that I'm wondering, why are you silent? Why is it taking so long? But Heavenly Father, Here's my decision. I will find you in the storm. I will not turn aside. I will not give up. I will not quit. But I will find you in the storm. And I am determined to put my faith into action right now. And I declare with my lips, I will see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living. You have a plan for me. 
a plan for good and not for evil. To give me a future and a hope. And I look to that hope. I look to that future. And I'm going to make it in victory with you, Lord. And thank you for your grace. Extended to me, I receive it. I receive it in Jesus' name. Let's give a shout unto the Lord, everyone in the room. Thank you for listening to this message brought to you by World Compassion, featuring Dr. Terry Law. For more information on how to get your copy of Storm Chaser, the Terry Law story, visit worldcompassion.tv.